Hey guys, Coach here. Man, thanks for uh, thanks for joining me this week. I don't know uh, when you might see this, but for Maestro and I, it is the beautiful June 1st of 2022 up in the Rocky Mountains of Northern Idaho. Man, you look around right now, most people have summer already blazing on them. And up here, spring is just getting into second gear. Just got out of the snow times. The melts are at their peak. And now it's, it's time for spring to really hit again. And we've kind of chased that. We've chased that all the way from the southern deserts up here now. Hey, this week we are talking about the forgotten stepchild of landscaping, a residential area. It really is. Most of the time, I don't know what you think, but when people think the word landscape, most of the time they always think about greenery. They think about the trees, the shrubs, the grass, the lawn. Can't wait for the, the, the dog to have a lawn to play on, the kids to have a swing set, blah, blah, blah. Well, the stepchild of the landscaping is the hardscape, the actual hardscape of a landscape. We're gonna go into great detail on this. Man, I'm glad you're here. Stick around, I'll be right back. You know, for, uh, for most people, most people can plant a plant. You know, they don't always plant it correctly, but let's face it, most people can put a shovel in the ground and they can put a plant in the ground. Most people can mow a lawn. And most people, you know, most people can trim a hedge and trim a bush and that kind of stuff. But how many of you out there can actually form up and pour a concrete patio, lay down a substrate and put in a paver patio or driveway? How many can build a patio cover? And some of the other slightly more difficult challenges that go along with landscaping. And it is one of the things that we do not think about, but is the definite bones, the backbone of any residential landscape. Now for some of you out there in the more rural or more remote areas of the country where you have acreage and mountain land, chances are you're not going to get into a lot of full long pavement or concrete when we talk about hardscape there a lot of times we're talking about driveways created out of graveled road base and gravel on top parking areas out in front of the house if you have a garage the garage is probably poured cement etc your outdoor living areas in situations like that may be cemented, but chances are you probably have decked those things out. So you DIYers, what are you guys? Drop a comment in the, in the comments below and let me know at what level, what level one to 10 do you have a skill set to take on the hardscaping part of your landscape project? Are you a one, meaning coach, help me out all you can here? Are you a 10 and on the verge of being a pro and you can tackle just about every hardscape situation that is thrown at you? I'd really like to know. So before we get really into it, let's define that hardscape definition. Now this is, this is my definition. Uh, I, there's probably more than one out there, but I kind of look at it as this. Anything in the landscape that does not directly serve the growing portion of the landscape itself does not serve it. It may complement it maybe, but it doesn't serve it. And what do I mean by that? Well, you could probably take an irrigation system and say, hey coach, you know, the sprinkler system that I have out there, it's part of the hardscape. Well, not really, because it really serves that green portion. Or what about, uh, what about my lighting system? Well, it complements the green, so it's kind of on that fringe, you know, it's sort of hardscaping, but it's really not. So that's my definition, something that does not directly serve the green portion of your landscape. We're going to start off with durable surfaces. And for any of you who followed me, and I definitely cover it in the ebook and in the home course, durable surfaces of a landscape are a paramount element in it. It really is. I think it's you're not serving yourself or your family or the, the property itself if you don't have a solid, durable surface that circumnavigates your back, front, and side yards, where you could go out there in your bare feet if you had to and walk all the way around. 
And when I say durable surface, I'm not talking gravel and I'm not talking decomposed granite. Sometimes I guess if you want to walk on it, you could. I'm basically talking cement, basically talking paver block type of situations. Something that is easily walked on barefoot or in slippers or flip flops, whatever you want to call it. So I said in the opening that most DIYers or even the folks who aren't even DIYers, they're, they, when they hear the word landscape, we think about what we're going to put in the ground and how it's going to take our new home or different home from a dirt lot to something really pretty. And we often overlook those elements that allow us to get through the pretty and to the shed and out to the driveway. These durable surfaces are paramount element of any residential landscape. And it's really important to have them done right. Now, let's talk about concrete first. Concrete uh, forming, pouring, and finishing is, it is a labor. It is laborious, but it is also an artwork. And it takes a skilled hand with a lot of experience to really do it correctly. I was very blessed. Now I'll tell you up front, total transparency here. Concrete work is not my fave. It's not in my top three faves of landscaping. It really isn't. I can form it, I can pour it, and I can finish it to a point, but I am not a professional finisher. Where I generally focus most of my concrete work on was uh, hot tub pads, shed pads, things along those natures. For the real professional, where I really called in the pros was the finishing of my walkways that I was having done, my back patios, uh, sitting patios, those type of things. I had a great guy by the name of Tony, and Tony and his crew knew exactly what to do, how to do it. Many times I had them form stuff up. Many times I did the forming to save a few bucks and keep the cost of the job down. 90 5%, 95% of all concrete pours in a residential setting are probably going to be two by four thick. They're not going to be much more. In some places you might go two by six if you have really heavy type of uh, uh, vehicles that are going to go onto it. Then maybe you want to put a little extra. You might want to reinforce a lot of the places that you're going to pour. Uh, concrete wire mesh, rebar, uh, fiberglass uh, infill that goes into the mixer and you pour it with that. These type really tight to tighten up and hold that concrete and doesn't allow it to lift and settle. And very, very important. That's where you see a lot of driveways with the cracks and the, the shifting ups and downs, especially in the northern latitudes that have a little bit of frozen ground and uh, frost heave and thaw make sure that you reinforce your investment. That way you're not going to have to worry about replacing or having it lifted later on down the road. Concrete comes in a variety of ways. You can have the standard gray. You can have it colored up. You can have it finished with beautiful rubber stamped type of finishes. The cost on average is basically around $6.60 to $7. Now out in NorCal where I practiced, and that was back in 2018 was the last job. You're talking upwards of $7.50 to $8 a square foot for just simple broom finished concrete. And there were times where I charged customers upwards of $14 and $15 a square foot when we had colored, stamped, and then sealed concrete projects. That gets kind of expensive, especially when you talk about, you know, large patios of 400 square feet and five, six, and 700 square feet of walkway surfaces to form, pour, finish, stamp, and seal. A lot of labor that goes on in there. So maybe you can get by with my favorite, and that is a light horsehair broom finish with nice, uh, 12 inch band around the outside of it and a broom finish in with some nice expansion joints uh, troweled into it. Really looks good and serves the purpose very, very well for 95% of all concrete applications. Now, when you talk about strength of concrete, you can talk about what they call sack mix. And sack mix is gonna be uh, 
on the cheap four and a half sack mix and the standard is five five and a half sack and the premium the stuff that's really creamy and a lot stronger is six sack and i generally always ordered up six sack i did i didn't i didn't want to have a, a real gravelly finish when they were finishing i wanted to hear that smooth metal trowel going over there just like butter that's what it looked like when it got finished and it really for the the broom finishes it really finished up nice and it held the color very very well then i would come back through and throw a concrete lacquer on it that made it look that wet look by the time we got done with those jobs man it really looks slick so if you have the budget if you have the budget six sack is the way to go one of the things about these durable surfaces is it's something that DIYers with a little bit of research and a little bit of practice can really do themselves. We're talking about grades and slopes and making sure that the outer edges of your walkways and patios are sloped just slightly away from your house. I cover that quite a bit in the ebook and the course, and it's very easy to do. And not to get into a whole bunch of detail, or this video is going to be really long, but your prep work, just like in painting, your prep work is everything. If you have side to side level, front to back type of levels, reinforced, and then a good team of putting that stuff in on pour day and finishing it, you'll be fine. You really will. Now, if you have some high people in low places, then maybe you can call upon them. Feed them for lunch, feed them for dinner, and have them come in and help you get that stuff down and get it done right the first time. Because obviously it's concrete. You don't want to have to redo it. You really don't. So that finishing technique and everything, there's a million different YouTube channels out there that'll show you exactly how to go about finishing, uh, screeding, reinforcing, all that kind of stuff. And I suggest you check that out. Now, when we're talking about durable paver patios and driveways, everything about pavers, and they're a beautiful look, they really are, but everything is in prep. That substrate, that that excavated soil that you take out of the area and then you put in a nice four inch minimum worth of um, road base compaction, class two or AB base, depending on what it's called in your area, really compact that down with a mechanical compactor. I like the Wacker type of compactors, the one that kind of vibrate across and not the Pogo, but you use whatever you can find. That has to be compacted to almost like a 90% ratio. It really does. So you don't have any movement. And again, slope is important. And then we put down some three quarter pipe or half inch pipe, whatever you feel comfortable with, and then do your sand top fill to the top of that pipe. Compact it all down and then pull those pipes, trowel out those little troughs that the pipe left, and you are ready to put down pavers work from one end and work out onto your paver base very very important don't walk across the sand base once you're all ready to go you start at a flat edge and you work towards or work away however you've done it and work consistently use a rubber mallet to tap into place just a little bit if you have a little bump in the sand or whatever and it'll come out beautiful so when we're talking about finishing off that durable paver walkway or patio or driveway, at the end, we do what we call infill. And it's generally a sand infill that you're gonna, you're gonna distribute across your, your working and then go back in and broom the sand into the joints to stabilize it, stabilize it and hold it in place. The industry standard that is out there now is what they call polymeric sand. And that polymeric sand has a binding agent in it. So when you broom it into the joints and you get it cleaned off, you, you blow off the excess and you wet it. Once you wet it, it solidifies it really, really hard so that you don't have any lateral movement anymore. It also helps a little bit for ants and stuff that might be underneath the patio area from sending up their little, their little mounds and stuff and in, in and out to their nest down there. That polymeric sand really hardens up almost like a, a dry mortar mix, if you would. And it is really paramount that you get it done. The other thing is, is the edging of these walkways and the edging of the, the driveways. Most people, most pros, the walkways will be done with a mortared edge 
you mix up some, some mortar and uh, sand and you mortar that edge in at kind of a beveled triangle. If you, if you saw the, the edge of the pavers, you would drop down just a little bit and then bevel a finished pour of that mortar mix and it will hold it. Then you can mulch to that edge or you can uh, put soil over it and then put sod on it, whatever you want to do. But the other thing you can use is you can put a true concrete edging on the edge of your driveways and your walkways, um, four inch minimum. And you can use metal edging too, where the, they join at 20 foot sections and you can stake that down. That's another way to do it. But this, this will keep those projects together. And with the polymeric sand going down in, you'll have years and years of service without having any maintenance. Don't do it right. If you don't do those pavers right, you will get a rumple and a settling in it. And it's very noticeable and quite frankly, it looks hideous. So make sure you study up on it. Make sure you do it right. And the compaction is everything. I think from the professional angle, you are going to pay more for a paver type of hardscape than you would concrete. But uh, everything is regional and everything is local. It also depends on the availability nowadays of anything. Hopefully you can find those things, but I know they're out there. I, I know they're out there. But this kind of durable surface should circumnavigate your whole, whole property so that you can travel safely. Here's another thing, a tip for driveways and for walkways, and that is dimension. You know, most of your uh, production homes give you about a 16 foot driveway, enough to get in, you know, two cars kind of tight and get into a two car garage, and that's about it. For something that will really help you out in the long run, make sure your driveways have at least 20 feet. So the bigger cars that we have in some cases, you know, if you have SUVs or whatever you might have, you know, you can open doors out and people can get in and out without having to worry about door dinging the, the car next to them. Another thing on walkways, three and a half foot minimum, suggested four, and with everything in a walkway coming up to a patio, coming up to the driveway, coming up to the front door, I really suggest that you flare it out. Flare it out and give yourself a lot of room at those adjoining areas. Why? Transitional space for people walking, wider space for getting things by. Say for instance, um, you're having to hand truck a new refrigerator in and you've got a four foot gate and you have a nice six foot flare coming from both sides of the gate. So when you open up that gate, you have plenty of room to navigate around with that refrigerator. Same thing when you come up to the patio, people can come and go. When it comes to patios, strongly urge you to take furniture, barbecues, lounge chairs, toy boxes, pool boxes, whatever it might be, and lay them out where your perspective patio is going to be. Then do some measuring. Most people do it the other way around and they'll go put their patio in and then bring in their furniture and their barbecues and all the things and realize, holy crap, this 16 by 16 patio is not big enough and they have to add on or they have to shrink the toys they're putting on the patio. Strongly suggest that you go out there and put your things first, then measure it out. Most of the time, you'll always find that you're going to need a little bit more space. You really will. Now, that's about durable surfaces. That's about the, the hardscape that allows you to get in and around and create the greenery and the love and the color that you're going to put out there that's actually going to grow. But there are some other parts of hardscape that people don't think about too much kind of like the surroundings I'm in right now. How about huge patio covers so that you can go out there and enjoy the patio three and even four seasons out of the year. Patio covers are a fantastic option. They can be a little bit this if you're doing it professionally, but you know, I have seen a lot of guys build their own aluminum and steel metal type of patio covers. I was always a wood guy. I used dug fir and redwood and built probably two dozen big arbors in my day. I really liked the warmth of the wood and I was able to um, stain it or seal it and make it really, really look nice and then run some lighting up into it. 
it was it was really a nice touch on top of a patio but one of the things i want you to remember is when you're doing this say for instance the checkbook only gets you the patio this year and you got to save up for some other stuff but when you're doing your underground phase and you're getting ready to form up and do your your patio and whatnot make sure that you think ahead and you know that hey i'm going to have i'm going to have an outdoor kitchen over here in a couple of years i'm going to run water i'm going to run power i'm going to run you know a, a propane or a gas type of uh, line over there i'm going to have a fire pit that's going to be a natural gas or propane fire pit i'm going to have a water feature towards the back corner of the yard someday so it's going to need power for the pump and maybe a transformer for some lighting and stuff so remember to sleeve underneath these things put your electrical down to code and your gas lines down to code and then stub them up and cap them off before you get that that concrete in place so you're not having to go back and tear up a new landscape in order to put these things in later on that planning part is paramount to making sure that your phase of your landscape just transitions from one to another to another and you don't go oh holy crap i forgot to you don't want that so do a punch list do a punch list for your hardscape you're going to put your underground stuff in you're going to put your cabling you're going to put anything gas electric whatever it is and then you're going to bury that compact it down and then move forward with your forming of your concrete or your pavers whatever you're going to do so what other kind of hardscapes we talk about patio covers we talk about electrical and gas and all these other things think about water features think about maybe slatted shade arbors remember fencing is part of your your hardscape as well what kind of fencing are you going to use we were out here in a in northern idaho and i noticed they really liked the black vinyl chain link to keep the deer and stuff out of the out of the landscapes because the deer you know they eat everything up here and it really looks slick we use that quite a bit down in the norcal central valley area and the fencing is very very nice when it first go in just be aware that that vinyl will fade and it'll get that grayish black look after a few years but it still looks better than nothing and it keeps the pest out so lastly the other little hardscape elements that are kind of in my book kind of luxury items and they may be things that you put in after your initial you got your yard together you just don't have a dirt lot no more you can with a little bit of planning you can come back and do these things later okay so we talked about patio structures how about water features for the diy level and even for the pros i really attack the niche of water features that were just self-contained um, basins and a water fixture or feature that stands over the top of the basin for running dribbling and water sound you could also do the pondless waterfalls i'd love those things we had those at weed patch ranch i've discussed them in other videos but they really work well for the diy why because you can do it in a weekend you can you can order it and have it delivered or go pick it up bring it back on a friday evening or so and you can put those things in over a weekend especially the the self-contained basin ones they're four hours and you can have those things knocked out if you're doing a pondless waterfall those things require getting some cobble and some boulders and and rubber liner and underlayment and doing those things right so study up on them if you really like to look go to aquascape incorporated that company is what i used for years and years and years they're a fantastic company and they have a lot of video out there that'll give you some great ideas and some how to's i suggest you check them out okay what about sheds if you checked out if you checked out the the video series that i did on designing from the job site I really suggested to my client there that they take out an old kind of useless shed and put in a nice 12 by 12 storage shed brand new color it to the other shed that's there and to the house so everything looks congruent but it was going to be able to take all the stuff that they had in their one car garage and organize it and place it in that shed and then we created a whole usable one car garage for either a vehicle what a concept 
or at least a traffic flow pattern from inside the house through the nicely spaced garage and out into the brand new backyard. Sheds are a fantastic hardscape element that can really alleviate a lot of storage, both seasonal and permanent type of things that we collect and store them out of the way and in a neat waterproof system so that you don't have that cluttered, scattered look everywhere. Very important to have. One of those things that I had three or four of them in all the houses that I had, and it's a way to keep organized and it's a way to keep things out of sight and out of mind so that you can use it. In this case, in that design series in the backyard, it worked out great. And I really hope that they institute that idea. Lastly, lastly is just kind of garden art and whimsy that you kind of add personal touches to your backyard. It can be anything from obelisks to fence and wall decorations, those types of things that they don't really, they don't lend anything to the greenery. It's more of personal touch. And that's something that's really important to a lot of folks. I had a couple of doozies in my career where I walked into backyards and I saw garden art and whimsy on steroids. It was just, it was a backyard with a big pool and every part of the fence and back walls was covered in, you could call it artwork, but it made it very, very busy. And I think there's a, a level of taste you know, and, but everybody's different. So you consider what your level is, but personalize it out there. It can be beautiful. It can also reflect your personality and your likes and interests. Hey guys, that's what I have. Hey, if you haven't checked it out, this hardscape stuff, when you get into container gardening and other stuff, you should check out some of the plants of the week. Go take a look at like feeling blue Deodore cedar. How about the vine maple that's over on Plant of the Week this week? Fantastic plants for container gardening, decorating those patios and decks. And let me know what you think. Also, check out some of my other educational videos. All of these things kind of all tie together so you, the DIY homeowner, can take your landscape to the next level and have a real professional look without the professional cost. I thank you for staying with me. And as always, to your landscape success, take care.